Welcome to our 21st annual Greater Akron Speaks Out for Values Breakfast. Right there. Yeah. And I retold God, and I don't know if he listens to me, but I said, I want to be around for the 50th. So we'll see how that works. Anyway, as you hear in most places, I'm used to saying this in church, please turn off your cell phones, alarm clocks, iPads, beepers, and church bells. Okay, and speaking of church bells, notice how I slipped this in. I do have to ask you, I can't help it, I'm a Catholic priest. How many of you got up at 3 a.m. yesterday morning to watch the popes get canonized? Whoa, don't you have a life? Anyway, hey, but I do have to tell you uh, uh, just one story about uh, Pope John the 23rd, who, who was Pope from 58 to uh, 63. Uh, and, and I think this ties in with faith at work. Uh, a journalist one time asked him, how many people work at the Vatican? And this is true. He responded, about half of them, <laughs> you know. So hopefully we enter into our work a little more. Um, Again, uh, we sold out. Thank you very much. 680 people here and uh, uh, coming forth. Yeah, we can say good to that, too. Last time I saw this big a crowd was on Easter Sunday. And by the way, I'm going to give you a 45-minute sermon. You think I'm kidding? I am. OK, any first-timers raise your hands. First time here. OK. Uh, and glad to have you with us. And you need to know that way over here, those, those two tables over here, the, the first timers, raise your hands. Over here, these folks are our special guests, people who work in Cuyahoga County, an area in which we're going to be expanding into. Let's give them an Akron welcome. <laughs> and you'll hear uh, more about that plan a, a little bit later. You know, as a priest, and I've been blessed uh, heart to heart, we actually formed an, as a not-for-profit in 1990, but it's given me a wonderful opportunity that a lot of uh, clergy don't have to get to know so many in the business community. And I know in seeing so many of your lives, and believe this deeply, that the work you do is a sacred calling. You know, often people speak of the clergy in that way, but anytime we touch other people's lives, Anytime we share a part of who we are, what we believe in, what we stand for, that's sacred work. And I want to thank you for doing that and continuing to do that. And so many here in this area wanting to make a positive difference in the community and all the collaborations that happen to make that go. Uh, we especially want to thank our breakfast corporate sponsors, many of whom have been with us for the entire 21 years. And you'll notice in the program we have listed on uh, the front, uh, one of the, the gold sponsor, the Pass Foundation, and then also we have our in-kind sponsors, uh, the Akron Beacon Journal, Mosier Media, and the Cyrano Group. Now, if you got that program on the back, you can see listed all our sponsors, including at the silver level, level Akron Children's Hospital, Ann and David Brennan, Comdoc, J.W. Dodato Electric, a Quanta Services Company, the Maynard Family Foundation, and Soma Health System. Also, if you're looking on the back, you can see the folks at the copper and at the bronze levels and our patrons. We are, and take a moment to notice those. And we are grateful to all of you for investing in this mission uh, to foster greater value, spirit, and higher purpose in our workplace and community. Let's thank our sponsors. By the way, I thank them in a special way. A lot of people don't realize this. The diocese doesn't pay me. Heart to heart does. So I'm real thankful for, for all that all of you do. In addition, please notice on the inside left page of the program, our board of trustees with Dan Chackey as our chair. And on the inside right page, we have listed our breakfast committee, chaired by Lisa Hilling. Included in this committee is our executive assistant, you may have seen her coming in, Sarah Leyendecker, 
whose wonderful spirit and organizational abilities are deeply appreciated, especially, you know, when Larry and I, co-founders, aren't always as strong in that area. Thanks God we have an executive assistant like Sarah. The board and breakfast committee have given their hearts and souls to our work, and please, all of you, I'm going to ask all those who are part of that committee and, and, and those who are on our, uh, on our board, please stand for a moment. So we get to see you. Don't be shy. Where are they? They're all busy. Some. Okay, let's thank them. You know, individuals from time to time sometimes ask us what Heart Dark Communications is all about. I probably told you in the beginning when we had, we first named ourselves that, to, we did have a branding issue because some people thought we were a dating service. And uh, I was willing to find them a good Catholic girl, but that didn't work out. But you know that uh, what we do, we do way more in addition to this breakfast, and, and we know many of you are curious about what we do. Well, we do have, uh, uh, some of you have received this in previous years, but on every table, a, a couple of the uh, brochures that talk about Heart to Heart, the various programs we do, and outreach we have over these last several years. And many of you have been involved as volunteers in that, and we're grateful for you doing that. Uh, now I'm going to ask you to take a moment. I know there's some blue cards. Some of you have the information, but uh, we'll get through this. Uh, the blue cards on the table, we ask you to fill out the card that you have received. Especially, it expresses various interests in addition to giving us your email. So you may have done this before, but if you have particular interests, we follow up this with letting you know, without bombarding you with lots of emails, what else goes on to help foster for all of us our personal and spiritual development as a source of enriching workplaces. So you'll notice, uh, by the way, quarterly connections. We have a breakfast, obviously smaller, usually at the First Congregational Church, four times a year. And uh, on May 29th, and you'll get information about this, Ken Babby, who is the owner and a vital spark plug for this community and owner of the Akron Rubber Ducks, will be, uh, will be speaking that day. You can see some of the other things that are pretty uh, clear cut. Also, we have some various monthly series going on, and again, pretty self-explanatory. But I do ask you, if you're uh, to consider filling that out, give us your information, put it in the basket. And as you're doing that, many of you know, maybe not everybody, but we sent an email blast that we recently hired an associate director for Heart to Heart Communications Tony Vento, a talented, faith-filled, and competent person to fill this position. His main focus, I mentioned before the Cuyahoga County guests, his main focus will be outreach to the people of Cuyahoga County. He will now speak with us briefly uh, with a special request. Let's welcome Tony. I'm glad he's a part of us. Thank you, Father Norm. Good morning. Well, I'm still not quite a morning person. Can I get an amen from anyone else who's not quite a morning person? Amen. All right. But you know that there's a proverb that it's better to light a candle than curse the darkness. But I admit this morning, I was not that holy in response to my pre-dawn darkness when the alarm rang. But over the years, I've experienced excellent heart-to-heart -heart communications early morning programs, enough to make me want to get out of bed and go including the Resilience Series, the Enneagram for Leadership and Spiritual Growth Series, and the Love and Work Retreat. In the course of these programs, I developed a love for heart-to-heart -heart communications, the unique way in which it brings together the search for values, spirit, work of our lives together, work being any productive activity of our lives, some of which happens to be paid. So I came to this breakfast for the first time last year it's way in the back. And before I arrived, I didn't realize the kind of inner light that would shine for me at this breakfast. But it began as people streamed in, across the bridge from the parking lot, up the sidewalks, and into breakfast. It was like seeing many of those candles coming together, those kind of candles that dispel the darkness instead of cursing it. And by the end of the breakfast, I was noticing the kind of energy, the kind of light 
that Heart to Heart Communications builds year round through its unique programs, mission, and vision. So my imagination was caught, and I remember leaving here thinking, wow, don't the rest of the folks in Northeast Ohio need something like this too? What if there was an increase of five, 10, 20 times of this kind of energy? We have that kind of need in Northeast Ohio. Akron has been the proving ground for it. It's time to take it further. As it says in a favorite gospel passage of Father Norm and Larry and myself, a city set on a mountain cannot be hidden nor do they light a lamp and then put it under a bushel basket. It is set where it gives light to all. Now for it to shine, it requires the wisdom from that old spiritual song. Keep the lamp of your lives trimmed and a burning for the sacred work of this world is not yet done. Keep, keep the lamp of your lives trimmed and a burning. As my Jewish brothers and sisters say, that sacred work that sacred work is accomplished in tikkun olam, the healing of the world. So how about letting your imagination work now? For heart-to-heart -heart communication to grow and share more of this light with the rest of Northeast Ohio, it's not us who are the key, it's you. Who can you think of who would benefit from a more positive, purposeful, collaborative, and values-based work environment? Can you think of any workplace, community group, faith community, or an individual who might grow with what Heart to Heart Communication offers, especially in Cuyahoga County as we get started with that geographic focus in our expansion? So please take a moment to remember them. Now, begin to let yourself notice them. Let them call to you in your imagination. And remind yourself of the benefit they could receive from Heart to Heart Communication. So then I ask that you take that same blue card that Father Norm pointed out. And on the back side, just write the letters CC for Cuyahoga County. And when you leave that in the basket, I'll follow up with you to understand what it is that you're thinking about, who you're thinking about, those organizations you're thinking about. Go ahead and, and fill those out. Just make sure your name and contact information are printed clearly. Sarah has made sure that we pay attention to printing those clearly. Or you could take a business card and do the very same thing. Just write CC on the back, drop it in the basket here. Or you could meet me out front right by the registration table. There'll be a large sign that says growing in Cuyahoga County. And you could meet me there, turn it in, and I'll be glad to meet you personally and hear your ideas and follow up with you later. I'm incredibly grateful for the 30 years of work and love given by so many who are at the foundation of the organic growth of Heart to Heart Communications. I want to give a special shout out to Father Norm, to Larry Villeman, to Sarah Leindecker, our executive assistant, the past staff, the past and present board members and the stakeholders. You have built so well. And when I describe this work to those who know me well and are starting to get to know Heart to Heart Communications, they inevitably notice that it's a great alignment in mission, vision, values, and people. They say, why hasn't more of this happened already in Cuyahoga County? And I thank the folks here who are at the vanguard for helping spread that word. So I'm grateful to serve this growth and intentional expansion, given everything I can to serve your needs and growth. And after the breakfast, I'll see you in the registration area. I'd love to hear your ideas, share more about how we're already growing in Cuyahoga County, where we've established our office, to work on our refining our business plan and maybe you can become a heart to heart ambassador as well. And finally, one last thank you to Gail Canary who did not know I would do this. My wife, uh, for, thank you for being who you are. Your love and work changes the world. You're the gift that brought me here to Northeast Ohio, native of South Florida that I am. And without you, I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be anywhere else. Thank you. I think you can see why the Spirit moved us, that Holy Spirit, to, to discern uh, Tony to be part of this mission. Another real practical announcement uh, for free parking, you can show the attendant your ticket to this breakfast. And if you don't have a ticket, there's extras outside. 
Right now, typically we usually start with the prayer, uh, but here we put the prayer a little bit in the middle to say, obviously, at any point, at any time, anywhere, the call to prayer is there. And, and, and I feel very fortunate to be able to introduce the woman who is going to give this invocation right now, this prayer that brings us all together, and that's Judge Linda Teodosio, judge of the Summit County Juvenile Court, to offer our invocation. Sure. Good morning. Let us gather together this morning in the presence of our God to give thanks for his many blessings and to ask for his guidance individually and as a community as we face the aspirations, failures, and redemptions of our inner journey, aspiring still. Let us pray. God of grace and mercy, we pray that you teach us to use our hands to work for you, our hearts to always be kind, our eyes that we might search for the good around us, our ears to hear what is true, and our minds that we may be wise in living our lives. We ask that you bless the food with which you have blessed us this morning, bless those who prepared and served it, and the fellowship that we share here this morning. Bless our speaker, Dan Flowers, that he might inspire us to remember that there are those with no bread and others with no one with whom to share their meals. Let us pray for them as well. Finally, we ask that you bless the people of this community. Guide us to be more thoughtful, prayerful, generous, and kind. Help us to be mindful of the needs of others as we gather here today and go about our daily business and our individual lives. We ask this heart to heart in God's name. Amen. Amen. Let me hear that amen one more time. Amen. amen. Okay. Um, we also want to thank uh, our public officials. They truly are public servants uh, who serve this community in many ways. And uh, th this gives me to this point to introduce a man who needs no introduction. If you've never met him, you haven't been in Akron. And that's our mayor for, what, 27 kind of years? Something like that. Mayor Don Plasquelic. We're very grateful to have him as our mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the opportunity to stand here really, as I see it, as a way for the whole community to be represented in one person to say thank you to Larry and to Father Norm for all that they do in our workplace and our organizations and institutions. But just as every other time I've been given a microphone, I could just sit down, but it's not in me to just do that. <laughs> Father Norm, you talked about uh, whether or not anyone had been up early to see the Pope and the events taking place. And actually, two weeks ago, I was with my daughter and two granddaughters at uh, St. Peter's Square and got up early to see the Pope uh, at uh, his Wednesday Mass. And I'm not sure of this because he was speaking Italian, but I think he said that he was very aware that the diocese wasn't paying you, and he thought that they received exactly the value they expected. <laughs> Well, that was pretty good. And there's a point to that, and it is that Father Norm and Larry are regular people that have helped provide leadership in important issues here in dealing with how we deal with each other. And I would argue that's one of the most important things that they've done. Someone once joked that of all the people that try to give me advice that I don't listen to, I listen to Father Norm and Larry more than anybody. Um, but. I want to thank you. I appreciate it very much. And while you may have other comments, I want to mention this uh, for the purpose of reminding you, uh, all of you, that you mentioned Children's Hospital. And uh, I hope that all of us keep Bill Considine and his family in our prayers as he's dealing with the loss of his father today and over the next several weeks and months. A uh, great leader in our community that I think exemplifies exactly what you teach everyone. And uh, I'd ask all of you to keep him in your prayers and thoughts. Thank you, Father Norm. Thank you, Larry and Carol, most of all. Thank you for keeping the two of them in line. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. We're going to take this time a special moment to remember Mary Ann Boland. Many of you here 
are graduates of Leadership Akron. And you know that she went home to the Lord this last summer. And uh, we already miss her deeply. She was assistant director of Leadership Akron from 1989 to 94, and then became executive director from 94 to 2005. And I think so many of you know, she was like a foster mother to all of us in the program. In fact, from my Catholic background, I used to say, oh, you're a nice mother superior, you know? And uh, again, she nurtured us. She had seven children, and we were all her kids in some way. And she was one of our inspirational speakers at this Greater Akron Speaks Out for Values breakfast. She volunteered on many nonprofit boards, being very community-minded. And after her so-called retirement, she came to work part-time at Heart to Heart Communications, which meant she was there between 40 and 45 hours a week. That was Marianne. Uh, she helped us significantly with her characteristic gusto. Uh, I mentioned she had seven children, 17 grandchildren that she and her husband Harry enjoyed in their latter years, and Harry was, died just a few months before her, and, and they had made their 50th anniversary. And I, I believe Paul, is Paul Boland here? Do I see Paul? Right there, sure, excuse me. Paul Boland is, their, is one of their seven children, representing the family. Let's thank the family through Paul for giving us Marianne in this community. And I saw Marianne several times in the midst of her two year ordeal with cancer. Even while suffering, she still considered life a blessing. And she lived with a deep Christian faith that love is stronger than death and that life is eternal. And now we have a very brief video presentation and Marianne will speak for herself and show us her wonderful family. What makes a leader to me is a good listener and a, and a person who can say thank you and good job um, and not just be above everyone else and we have a lot of those in Akron, Ohio. going. I, I just love life and I love work. Um, I have a wonderful family. Uh, they're busy, active. I, um, I love a challenge. Um, ask me to do something and I'm on it I, because I want to get it done and find out what the end result is. And I think uh, just loving life and um, counting my blessings every day. Love you, Marianne. Um, good, morning. good morning. I'm Dan Collintone, uh, president of the Greater Akron Chamber. Uh, it's an honor for me this morning to introduce Dan Flowers. Being a part of the Greater Akron Chamber 
um, and representing the business community, I can't help but remember 10 years ago when I met Dan and the moment that we got introduced, I knew, as a, one of his board members said to me recently, Dan is the real deal. I really am pleased and honored to introduce him. In fact, what's not part of the inter introduction is uh, I was kind of inspired this morning because God kind of sent me a message as I was driving here this morning. It's amazing how he works. Um, a good pastor friend of mine who I love still dearly sent me a little voicemail and he said, Dan always lives up to his name. Every time he enters a room, there is a beauty and an aroma that erupts, kind of like a flower. His personality and values really do carry him. As a community, we are for, so fortunate to have Dan, who cares about hunger's effect on so many people in Northeastern Ohio, from the youngest to the elderly, including parents who lost their jobs or working in low wage jobs to put food on the table for their children. Through Dan's infectious commitment of caring and love for people, he has made sure that those less fortunate in our community have the ability to get good, healthy, high quality food for them in a respectful and dignified way. During his tenure, the food bank has experienced significant growth, increasing food distribution from 9.1 million pounds to more than 24 million pounds in 2013. In 2012, Dan and his team and his board and frankly, the community that he has led under his leadership, the food bank, our food bank, here in Akron, was named the food bank of the year, the highest recognition achievable by food banks across this great nation. He is a true standout in his field, having served as former Vice Chairman of Feeding America's National Affiliate Council and is currently Vice Chairman of the Ohio Association Food Bank's Board of Directors. While engaged in many, and I mean many, local, state, and national organizations, giving his time and talent and leadership, I really know, and it's so appropriate with the tribute today, frankly, that he is so proud so proud of being a graduate of Leadership Act in Class 22. He demonstrates his caring leadership style each and every day with his coworkers, community, and most important of all, his wife, Holly, and their three children, Andrew, Jonathan, and Mary. Now, as I prepared, again, for introducing Dan this morning, I called some of his friends and board members and asked them for some words. It goes back to when I met Dan, and nothing really has changed. If anything, he's even more inspiring today. Words like energy, enthusiasm, intense, humble, passionate, entrepreneurial, collaborative, and one that we all can appreciate. He really does repl replicate love. I've asked for a couple quotes. Here's one. Anyone who knows Dan knows he is a man of great passion and commitment. Dan is one of our greatest community assets who has been a visionary leader who rallies individuals and businesses for the betterment of our community. And the final quote that I think reflects so much of heart to heart, I quote from a board member, never have I met an individual who outwardly demonstrates through his actions and words how deeply, how deeply he cares from the heart. Please join me to the podium, Dan Flowers. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Woo! What a beautiful crowd. Well, I tell you, I am thrilled to be here today. Thrilled at the opportunity to speak, uh, to be here with so many friends 
to feel the warmth and energy in this room, and I want to send it back to you this morning. I want everybody here to leave today knowing that you are loved, and I have every intention of spending the next 30 minutes telling you how beautiful and how splendid and how marvelous you are just as you sit in your chair right now. Uh, I'm thrilled with that introduction, Dan. Thank you uh, for sharing those kind words. It was uh, a thrill to hear your speech last year. Um, and I have to tell you, Father Norm and Larry, in the, in the warm-up for this um, event today, uh, it's never been more obvious to me, uh, certainly with the sellout today, that, uh, that uh, the success of this event is just simply a reflection of how much this community loves you. You know, in your authenticity and your willingness to go first. And so we're all here today celebrating you, and I hope you can sit in that and enjoy that while we're here, you know, because there's so much goodness in you reflected in all of these people that are here right now. And that tells you who you are, friends. I want to take a moment and uh, introduce my mom and dad that are here this morning, Chuck and Nana Flowers. Why don't you give them a round of applause? They deserve it. That's right. <clears throat> My brother Dave, his lovely wife Christy, their daughter Anna is here this morning too. And anybody here who knows me knows that Dave is my very best friend. Dave is a, uh, a counselor and a, a blogger and a mental health professional and a pastor. And... Um, He's got a popular blog, DaveKFlowers.com, where he writes about those issues. And aside from being an important source of, uh, of moral support for me this morning, Dave also was an important backup. Because if anything happens to me while I'm up here, Dave can just get up here and improvise a better speech than the one I've planned anyway. Uh, he's a wonderful guy. <clears throat> my kids are here today, Andy and, and John and Mary, the loves of my life. Um, I will probably choke up a number of times today, so I just want to, but I want to invite you to, to go with me. <clears throat> I got nothing to prove. Anyway, these kids have taught me so much about unconditional love, and, and my wife Holly is here, um, who is lovely and beyond faithful, and so dear and special to me. She's had me on a program since day one, everybody. Uh, and I suppose that says a lot about why I'm here today talking about aspiring. You know, I've thought a lot about the words I have to say today. And uh, as you listen, I want you to know that I am talking foremost to me. I'm not standing up here preaching a sermon to you about everything you need to do and everything you need to know. Everything I'm saying today has come out of my want and my interest to bring about a life that's in a reflection of who it is that I want to be. So uh, I'm not preaching at you. I'm standing alongside of you. And it's, a, it's remarkable that I'm even here. I've got to tell you, I was... Uh, I was uh, Last week, driving, uh, I went to Circle K like I do every morning to get coffee on my way into the office, and I was talking to uh, Nancy, who always uh, rings me up, and she said to me, uh, hey, I, I saw you in the paper. Uh, it looks like you got a big speech coming up. And I said, yeah. What's it called? Aspiring still or something? And I said, yeah. Yeah, that's it. She goes, well, I thought it was a really big deal, and I got the paper, and I showed it to my brother, and I was like, look at this. This guy comes in every day. He's just a regular guy. <laughs> and, I, and I said, you have no idea how right you are about that, you know? And I wanted to go on and tell her, yeah, uh, how, how much I struggled to get through high school, you know? How hard it was for me to read and pay attention. I want to talk about how much I've struggled with fear, you know, and a million other things, you know. Uh, in fact, uh, she didn't even know how much of a compliment she'd paid me to tell me that I'm a regular guy. It's, it's been a struggle to seem regular at times for me, people. So uh, it must be the therapy's working. <laughs> I told you I was going first, people. Seriously, one of the greatest joys in, in the success of the, of the food bank is the way that um, people react to me when they find out I'm dealing with the same things they're dealing with. 
And when they find out I'm struggling with the same things they're struggling with, you know, it's true. Although it's uh, much more comfortable for us to remain in our delusions of grandeur and superiority, which these jobs will do nothing but fuel, there's no, there, there's no hope for us there, friends. There's nothing but fear and, and isolation awaiting us when we live in that ego. And if any of us want deep and meaningful connections in life, we have to start by acknowledging our own brokenness before anyone else will ever let us get close to them. Letting your guard down, people, and being vulnerable is a whole lot safer than you may believe. You see, we're all just like little kids here in our suits and ties and nice clothes playing dress up. But we're all just little kids inside, and you know it's true. In my message to you this morning, the basis of my spiritual philosophy in this talk about aspiring still today is that when we strip away all of our fears and ego and pretense, when we let that go, when we release our tendency to base our self-worth on our productivity, when we release our opinions and ideas and even our relationships, we open ourselves up to the greatest truth that history has ever revealed. It's what I've come to call our complete and utter and always okayness. Wired into you, just as you are right now, is deep, deep meaning and infinite possibility. The fact that you are alive right here, right now, breathing air is the only meaning that you need. Hear me. Your life matters because you are alive and that's all you need. You are creation participating in creation and so am I. And when I look at you, I can love you because the essence of you is the essence of me. The God in you is the God in me. There is nothing that you can do to lose your fundamental value. Did you hear what I just said? There is nothing you can do to lose your fundamental value. You see, your ego wants you to believe that your ability to produce, your ability to have kids, if you get sick or if you somehow are physically impaired, that you have lost your value. But I have come to believe, after years of working with the poor, that the, that the things in life that we are so scared to lose are just things that sit on top of the eternal, eternally splendid essence that we showed up with on day one that has never left us and never will. All of the great spiritual teachers have known this, but we generally don't get it until we are faced with losing everything or right in front of people that have. If our value was based on our status, if our value was based on our relationships, what we produce or how hard we work, what hope would I have to offer the people that come day after day by the thousands to soup kitchens and homeless shelters and food pantries in this town every day? Seriously, there would literally be no hope for any of us if the best we could hope for or promise ourselves was the possibility of more stuff, right? I don't care if you're rich or if you're poor, my message has always been the same. Your life matters because you are in front of me right now. Now let's join hands together and let's work to unravel the suffering that's in our lives. Let's see if together we can get you past this pain that you're feeling. Let's see if together you can help me stop driving people away that are trying to love me. Let's see if together we can heal these old wounds or just figure out how to get you a bus pass. If our real purpose in life is not to help relieve each other's suffering and together build a better world, a more peaceful world, a more loving world for us to enjoy being alive in, Seriously, tell me what are we here? What are we here for? A new boat? You know. If you think the things that you are going to get in life 
The material things, the cars, the houses, and the boats are the things that are going to bring you happiness and satisfaction. You might want to see Pastor Dave on the way out. Because that will drive you to bits. That is what is grinding us to bits right now anyway. One thing my career has taught me is that there is no depth that you can fall to. Hear me. There is no depth that you can fall to and not find people willing to meet you there and love you and affirm your value as a human being. There is nothing for you to be afraid of. And one of the reasons I am most passionate about the food bank is because we believe deeply that your life matters. We want you to live. We want to give you this food so you can take it into your body and create the energy that you need to continue in your being, to continue in your possibilities and in your wondrous potential. We believe your existence, even in your broken state, makes this world a better place. Your smiles, if only for the person lying next to you in the hospital bed, make your life worth living. You will never stop being, being valuable. You will never stop being perfectly and eternally safe. You will never stop being eternally safe. You are okay. If some person or religion or institution ever gave you the impression that your life has no inherent goodness or meaning or is somehow beyond redemption, you were lied to. Now gather up all of your flaws, gather your flaws and fears and insecurities. Dave, and Christy, and Phil, and Norm, gather them up. And all that nonsense that you've been telling yourself about what's wrong with you, and set it in a pile behind you and walk with me. I want you to take ownership of just how good you are. Just how perfect. Just how packed with potential you are and that everyone you know is. And I also want to challenge everyone here this morning to take ownership of your thinking in new ways. What we think is much more of a social responsibility than any of us are typically aware of. And I believe in the words of my favorite author, James Allen. Little known, splendid, splendid thinker and writer. All of his work is in the public domain. You can just search up James Allen. You'll find it. He wrote in his, his great, great, most popular work called As a Man Thinketh that man is made or unmade by himself. In the armory of thought, he forges weapons by which he destroys himself. He also fashions tools with which he builds for himself heavenly mansions of joy and strength and peace. By the right choice and true application of thought, man ascends to the divine perfection. And by the abuse and wrong application of thought, he descends below the level of the beast. Between these two extremes are all the grades of character, and man is their maker and their master. Our starting place, friends, must always be owning our fundamental goodness and safety in God's universe. That's where we start. Own your safety and beauty and perfection in God's universe. That's number one. That is our basis. Our lives matter even at their lowest points. What you're scared of, you don't need to be scared of. You've got meaning even if it comes. We have to never give up that belief or we'll surrender our hope in humanity altogether, and we've done that all too many times. Aspiring on from there, we must acknowledge that there is an immediate and unassailable connection to our thoughts and what we bring about in the world. We think we're alone a lot of the time. I think I'm driving to work by myself, but what I'm doing while I'm driving to work is cultivating thoughts I'm going to bring into the office that day. And you're doing the same thing. And you cannot think something that's wrong or hurtful or violent against me without me being the recipient of that as soon as we, as soon as we uh, make connection. 
And that's the truth. We are so connected, it's incredible. We're all wired into the same system. Our thoughts and ideas, our moods and behaviors have an enormous connection upon one another. We make or unmake ourselves as individuals and a society by what we think about individually and collectively. What we aspire toward still in the presence of our flawed attempts, listen, is to bring out about a reality that is in alignment with our greatest hopes for what we want to be. We have to own the fact that our thoughts create our reality. That's true for me, that's true for you, and for all of us collectively. Some people call it the law of attraction. Some people call it the power of prayer. However it's packaged, it's a universal law and we're all subject to it. If you're taking notes, I've made two points so far. Everyone has fundamental meaning and that our thoughts create our individual and collective realities. The tree is always best known by its fruit. The tree is always best known by its fruit. As Dr. King taught us, the ends are always alive inside of the means. You cannot bring about ultimately positive changes in your life and ends in your life or in your relationships or in work in society as a whole if your means are not ultimately positive. Happy tree Happy fruit, sick tree, sick fruit. You might get a short-term game, game nursing six fruit. I can give you examples of that all day long. Short-term games from people nursing six fruit, a sick fruit. I recently watched 12 Years a Slave. Did anybody see that movie? I was floored by it. I didn't even want to watch it because I knew how much it would affect me. What world were we living in? Treating people that way, you know? And there was people thought that they had means and ends that justified that sick behavior in our society. Eighty years later, Hitler arose in Europe, nursing sick fruit, thinking thoughts that he thought were right, and a lot of people signed on and they committed horrible atrocities against one another, you know? And here I am today at a motivational speech trying to aspire you to all do good and to live good and to think positive thoughts. But positive thinking and the laws of ends and means are two sides of the same coin, people. And I can't talk about the good things that come from good thoughts unless you recognize bad things come from bad thoughts, too. Thank you. Thank you. I got one friend. How am I doing, Dave? I got one, I got one other one over here. Thank you. That's why Jesus and Gandhi, and Buddha, and Dr. King, and every other enlightened teacher that's ever lived has been so passionate about the truth that nonviolence is the only pathway to true and lasting peace in ourselves and in our community. Friends, how could I possibly get up here in front of you today and give a speech about aspiring and not plead with everyone that can hear my voice for an end to our violence? Kindness is never a sign of weakness. Compassion is never a sign of fear. I aspire to the healing of our collective violence, people, both mine and yours. If we can at least stop letting ourselves believe that harming other people is unavoidable, let's stop thinking that we can't do this thing unless we kill other people. Let's stop thinking that we have to harm other people to survive. I mean, to, maybe I'm talking about aspiring folks. But isn't that worth aspiring to? A more peaceful, loving world? Let's just face it. We screw up enough on our own, you know? We hurt each other enough when we don't intend to. Can we aspire still to live lives that do no harm to other people? Friends? I say things like this all the time. And I know there are people listening to me that are thinking to themselves, there he goes again. You know? He talks all this stuff about love and peace and kumbaya, and let's all just hold hands. You know? I've heard him before. That's his stick. You know? But that's not practical. Go back and run the food bank, you know? which I'm always happy to do. 
And as the CEO of your food bank, the region's charitable response to hunger, I witness every day some of the most shining examples of individual and collective charity and goodwill that you could ever imagine. You name a good deed, and I have seen it. I have felt it. There isn't a more generous, giving, compassionate region in the country than here in Northeast Ohio, and that includes Cuyahoga County, too, friends. Just a I believe that's true. At the same time, we live in a state where the number of people living in poverty has increased every single year since 2000 to 2012. It stayed the same from 2012 to 2013. Poverty keeps on going up. One in seven people in our region live with food insecurity in their homes. One in four kids, at least one time during the year, doesn't know where their meal's next, their next meal's gonna come from. I see people all the time that are desperate and don't know um, <clears throat> where their next meal's gonna come from. My wife, Holly here, runs the food pantry at our church, the Community Bible Church in beautiful Ritzton, Ohio, and our pastor here is Scott Hindles here this morning. Excuse me. <clears throat> and at that pantry that my wife runs, we see people that are elderly, disabled, folks with mental illness, one of our clients, who also volunteered to help on pantry night, just killed himself two weeks ago. Last year, one of the moms we, try, uh, w w moms we help tried the same thing. We've seen the people that come to our food pantry lose their jobs. We've seen them lose their kids. They come in off benders with illness and addictions of all kinds. You name it, we have seen it, people. Most of them could never compete with any of you for jobs. If they stitch together a life on Social Security or disability benefits, food stamps, and a few bags of groceries from us each month without getting kicked out of their houses or sent to jail, they're doing all right. And when food distribution is finished, we come home and turn on the news, and too often we see commentators widely spreading misinformation about rare exceptions of fraud and abuse as a pretext for reducing our nation's commitment to fighting hunger. <clears throat> An undercurrent of deep resentment for the poor fueled largely by anecdotal stories of abuse and deep divisions on how to address their plight, has crept into our national dialogue. And it's tragic, and it's unproductive, and it's wrong, and it flies in the face of what I believe our collective aspirations are for this society. Resenting the poor is no pathway to solutions to poverty. And failing to agree on solutions is never an acceptable excuse for action, for inaction against a reality that's not in alignment with our aspirations for any people or any group. I'm going to say that again. A failing to, uh, our failing to agree on solutions is never an acceptable excuse for inaction. If this, in this social media driven society that we live in today, one can hardly state a circumstance that we all agree is a problem without people immediately retreating to their camps to declare their opposition to solutions that they have only speculated about. Aspiring still requires us to focus more on getting problems solved than dictating solutions to our maximum benefit. Those of us that work with struggling populations have come to know that helping people often means we must choose the, between the lesser of two evils. Saying yes to the poor sometimes means accepting circumstances don't always fit into our prescribed notions of how people are supposed to respond to our offers of assistance. Just like our kids. We always want people to care, that we care about to accept their truth. We want our kids to do their homework. And you, you guys, I'm talking to you. We want you to brush your teeth before bed. We want you to stay out of trouble and take care of yourselves and get a great job and live a fulfilling life, you know? But just like our kids, they don't always do that. And anyone that's raised kids knows that constantly acting disappointed in them is the best way to drive them out of your lives altogether. How could we assume that caring for the poor and hungry in society would be any different, right? Helping our kids become all they can be requires heaping doses of grace and love and patience and a willingness, despite all of the hurts and tears, to make sure that there is nothing they can do and that they know there is nothing they can do to lose their fundamental value in your eyes. Parents see this plainly, but we struggle to extend this understanding and grace to everyone else's kids. 
especially when they're 15 or 25 or 45 and they don't look like we do and they live on the other side of town. But folks that have been doing this work for a long time, for any amount of time, um, don't get callous to the disappointments and pain that is such a part of the experience of stepping into someone's life. They just simply know that the pathway to freedom and recovery always requires someone to take the first step over and over and over. And that's what I believe we as a society must do in the face of our most pressing challenges. Since the beginning of history, armies have met on battlefields around the world and literally slaughtered one another. But there has always been a band of people that showed up after the fighting was through. And they went across the battlefield. And they came to the aid of those that were injured on both sides of the fight. They didn't care what color their uniforms were before the shooting started. Because when the battle was over, they all looked the same. So it is true with you and me. All of us together. Aspiring to build lives and relationships that represent the best in us. That represent our common humanity and bring about more love and more understanding, more health in our communities, better schools for our kids, better dreams for our future. Aspiring still always requires us to drag ourselves back to the table, back into relationships that have caused us pain. Aspiring still requires us to go back to those battlefields in our lives, in our churches, in our city councils, and in our world where the blood of our loved ones has been shed. Our challenge, friends, is to dream the dreams and build the values that inspire us to aspire still. The ancient Greeks and Egyptians and all their culture and architecture, the Romans and all their might, the sailing Vikings, the early Americans as they rolled the plains, and our founding fathers that came after. In all of their great wisdom and achievement, none of these people inhabited this planet possessing the mighty power and potential to make or unmake our world as we do, right here, right now. We have in our hands the knowledge and technology to place ourselves in our universe in a context that has never been known before. We possess the potential to eliminate diseases, explore new worlds, make cars that drive themselves, and limitless other things. We can and we will do these things if we aspire to do them and to work to co-create a world where the impossible becomes possible. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if a generation was to arise here and now that said enough to the divisiveness that has held us back for so long? Enough of taking more for ourselves today and leaving less for the generations to come? Wouldn't it be great if a hundred years from now, two hundred years from now, when all of us are gone, if people said, this is the generation that got it right, you know? They were the ones that wrapped their head around the truth that all of life is sacred, that all people deserve an opportunity to breathe clean air and to know where their next meal is coming from. Those who came before us did not have a lock on truth. The people that lived before we were here did not have a lock on truth. Let's aspire to be more than those who came before us. Let's drag ourselves back to the table with healing hands and willing minds that don't put our own opinions and our own interests first. We live in a community full of brilliant minds. Brilliant minds all around this room. And as leaders, our job is not to dictate people's dreams and opportunities for them. Real leaders help bring the dreams of the people they lead into reality. Co-creation and collaboration is the only pathway to the maximization of our collective intelligence. The days of top-down leadership are gone. They're over. And I'm happy to see it. Let's each one of us here and now rededicate ourselves to examining our opinions, changing our minds and hearts, and being open to where collaboration and truth can take us. This past summer, Holly and I and the kids attended the funeral of Bill Pletzer. 
Bill is a legend in Rootstown. I got some Rootstown people here. Jeff was even at the funeral with us. And Bill's a legend in Rootstown, a World War II vet. He was the superintendent of schools in, in Hudson. Some of you may have even known Bill Pletzer. We knew Bill as our neighbor. He lived right next to us. And the kids used to call him Mr. Petzer. And Andy and John and Mary would go over and talk to him, and they were always so, he was always so sweet. And uh, everybody loved watching him interact with the kids, and he was a man's man and a leader's leader. And he was sick for a while before he died. He had uh, Alzheimer's disease. And uh, one time he wandered off, and, uh, and Holly found him in, in the neighbor's garage. Um, <clears throat> I didn't think his, fun his funeral would affect me like it did. Uh, we all knew it was coming. But when I looked down and, and I saw the kids in tears as they said goodbye to the very first friend they ever had to bury, my heart crumbled. And uh, before you knew it, all of us were crying. I mean, it was heavy flow. And then the tributes began and we just sat there letting go, being present in the moment and listening and nodding and smiling and being present, celebrating. And then an overwhelming awareness hit me that all of the great things we were saying and celebrating about, about Mr. Pletzer don't come automatic for anyone. What made Bill Pletzer kind and sweet and thoughtful was the fact that he chose to be. Even when he didn't feel like it, what made his marriage last for more than 60 years wasn't because it was always easy. Although his love for Marianne was a splendid sight, anyone who's been married for that long will tell you there were plenty of times when it would have been easier, or at least a whole lot more fun, to walk away. His daughter talked at length about how gentle he was. Anyone who's ever had kids knows that when they're driving you crazy sometimes, being gentle isn't always an easy thing. You see, we all have plenty of chances to, to blow it, you know? And a lot of times we do. Mr. Pletzer would be the first one to admit it that he, he blew it himself. But I believe that a life well lived, hear me now, I'm in the stretch, people. I believe that a life well lived in the end isn't just a celebration of virtuous outcomes. But it is equally a celebration of the decisions we make over and over and over and over again to rail against our lower nature. Or in Star Wars talk, refuse to go over to the dark side. And my challenge for you today in closing is to realize that there is an immediate and unassailable connection between your inner journey and our collective journey. Recognize that there is an immediate connection between your inner journey and our collective journey. If you are intentionally working to bring about a more loving, accepting, and compassionate and complete you, the inevitable consequence will be a more loving, accepting, compassionate, and complete world around you. Your Process is our process. Own that. If your life and if your relationships are not bearing the kind of fruit you'd hope for, remember that only a loving pathway will result in a loving ending. Please love and serve the poor and take care of your neighbors. Please forgive people that you don't want to forgive. Get, get closer to people that you may tend to judge. Please be open to changing your opinions. Please support the work of the food bank. Shelly just told me that Harvest for Hunger is running a little behind. We could use an extra gift. We love you. You matter. Listen to me. Your life matters. You're special. There is nothing that you cannot do. There is no challenge awaiting you that you cannot overcome. Nothing will ever overwhelm you. You can accomplish anything you set your mind to. You are beautiful. You are special. You are loved, ageless, perfect, splendid, and perfectly safe now and every day of your life in the hands of the God of all religions and of all people.
That's all I have to say. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, friends. Thank you, people. Thank you, people. Thank you, friends. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for that. Oh, there's an aroma up here. <laughs> Dan, thank you. I sit down. No, just. <laughs> On behalf of Heart to Heart Communications, we want to give you this small gift of appreciation. And, uh, hopefully, the food bank or food pantry can benefit from it, however, you choose to so divide nice. this up. Uh, God bless you, and thanks for all the good work you do in this community and the many people that you've blessed this morning. God love you. Thanks, Thank Brian. You. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Those of you who know me know that now and then I can get caught up in a heavy flow. And thanks for all the heart and soul, Dan, that uh, you put into whatever it is that you do. You know that commercial, what's in your wallet? I guess this morning the question is, what's in your heart? Or as my spiritual director often asks me, Larry, where are you experiencing ferment in your life? What's prompting you? You know, I don't want to go on here. I'm just the guy who introduces the word for the day and also introduces uh, our closing song. The word for today. Actually, the word was given to me last week by my wife, Carol. I said, you're not supposed to give me the word a week in advance. But there was something going on in her, and I think she had an intuition about today, about the passion with which Dan delivered what he had to say, about the passion that our mayor has for the city of Akron, about the passion that so many of you bring to what you do, about the passion that someone like Phil Maynard has when he has been so supportive of heart to heart over the years and takes the time to be here this morning, despite what he's going through right now. And Phil, you're in our prayers. Passion abounds. That is the word for today. And when my wife gave me that word a week ago, I don't know, hopefully she wasn't talking about anything going on in her life. <laughs> but I think she too has a good sense of what's going on in this community, about the good people that will gather on a Monday morning, TGIM, <laughs> just to celebrate one another and all that we bring to the table and beyond. God love you. Passion. You know, as we were talking, uh, there's, there's a verse from Proverbs that says, above all else, pay attention to the condition of your heart. For everything that you do flows from it. And as Dan was speaking, I thought of that verse. And I don't think that verse was all about paying attention to cholesterol. It's about paying attention to what we think, what we feel, what we believe, where we're grounded. Knowing that what we think, what we believe, what we feel flows out into what we do, what we say, how we communicate, how we commune with one another.
Are we willing to allow ourselves to be vulnerable? If I may, I didn't know really what I was going to say. Carol usually springs the word on me the day of the breakfast. And I appreciate that you, sp appreciate that you spring a few words on me now and then, such as, lighten up, Larry. <laughs> Don't be too serious, Larry. Chill out. Celebrate all that is right in our world. A young lady sent a letter to Comdoc last week, and it's because of an investment that Comdoc and Riley Lockridge and Gordy Opitz and so many wonderful people, Andrea Capuano from Comdoc, they're here. They've been so supportive of Heart to Heart. They initiated a leadership program in, in Green, where the company's located. And a group of young people gathered as leaders for tomorrow. A young lady was in the very first group with whom, and, and we partner with them in heart to heart. And a lot of, you know, leadership is all about what's going on in us, our own personal and spiritual development, and how that somehow impacts the people that are entrusted to us. And as Dan said so well, do we want the best for them? And this young lady is now a coordinator for service learning at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And I'm not going to be long here, but I had to say this because it brought me to tears. Just as watching Mary Ann Bolin, hearing Dan Flowers can bring you to tears. And it's okay. That's a gift. You got me going, Dan. The young lady said, the leadership program taught me the importance of vulnerability, which is a value I've carried forward in my future endeavors and one that I seek out in professional and personal relationships. This leadership program almost also demonstrated the power of relationships in leadership, which can only be achieved through creating a safe space where people can bring their whole selves, all identities, authentically to the table. I also learned to appreciate the importance of community. We cannot create change alone. And community uplift comes from all members working together to better the community. As Dan said, it's about lifting up others. And I'd like to bring up Charlene. Dijernay to close with a song. And I know she's going to sing uh, The Wind Beneath Our Wings. And I thought, isn't that really what it's all about? That each of us is called to be the wind beneath the wings of all the rest of us? To uplift others, especially at those times, as Dan said, when we're not feeling all that uplifted. Charlene, bless you. Come on up here and do your thing.
now, but not before one final amen. Let's hear you say it. Amen. amen. Go forth blessed to be a blessing for others. Don't just have a good day. Make it a good day. Thanks for being here among us. God bless one and all. Shake somebody's hand.